Welcome to Easter at our house. Laura and I are so happy to host you today. It's Easter Sunday, better known as Resurrection Sunday 2020. You're probably watching us from your house. Now we live out here, as we say in the South, in the country on 10 acres of land. You may have a similar home that you're watching from today, or you may be watching from in town or from a skyscraper in the city. We have friends and family that watch these videos from Lima, Peru to Manila, Philippines. And we just want to welcome you to our house. But now a lot of Christians this weekend are saying things like, oh, I wish we could celebrate Easter in the Lord's house. I wish we could be in God's house this weekend. Well, let me give you good news. That church building is a wonderful place and I can't wait for us to gather together in our church buildings again. But guess what? It's not actually God's house. No disrespect to your church building. It's a wonderful building, but it's not God's house. The Bible says that King Solomon built God's first house here on earth. He called it the temple and it was a wonderful place. But in the year AD 70, the Romans completely destroyed, burned it down, knocked it down, and there's nothing left except a little bit of the wailing wall. But now in the New Testament, the apostle Paul, he gave us really good news. He said, those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we are now the house of God. That's right. God's not living in a physical building. He's living in a physical person. He's living in you and He's living in me. We are God's house. So for this Easter Sunday message, I felt like the Lord wanted me to show you something really neat. He asked me to show you how the rooms in our physical house are very similar to the rooms in His house, which is in our heart. So I'm going to take you inside and show you just a few of the rooms in my house and how they relate to your house and God's house, whom you are and I am. Let's take a look together. Well, the first room I'm really excited to welcome you into is our kitchen. And of course, I love the kitchen because this is where we keep the food. Do you love the kitchen in your house? I bet you do. I visit this room not only during the day, sometimes I sneak into here at night. You know what I'm talking about. But I blame it all on Laura because she's a great cook. And one of my favorite things that she cooks is cube steak. Do you know about cube steak? I I'm not sure if it's a Southern thing or if everybody knows cube steak, but you need to know about it because it's gonna be in heaven. Cube steak, check it out. But seriously, Laura's not the only good cook I know. God is a great cook. In fact, God cooks something called the bread of life. The Bible calls itself the bread of life. And if you remember when Jesus was battling Satan out in the wilderness after 40 days of fasting, you remember what Jesus told him? When he beat Satan, he said this. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, physical bread, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. We're supposed to be living by the word of God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God or teenager of God may be complete. That has to do with our maturity. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, you may say, yeah, I know that, but I've been struggling. The truth is, since this pandemic hit, a lot of us have been struggling. We've been out of our routine. We're like, I can't find my groove. I, I haven't been reading my Bible like I know I should. Well, let me give you a couple suggestions. One is you could get your smartphone and the YouVersion app, download a Bible plan. They're called plans. And then invite a couple, two or three of your friends to join you. What that does, it not only gets you in the Word, it gives you accountability. A accountability is not a cuss word. It's actually a really good word that we all need in our life. Or if you say, I'm not a smartphone kind of person. Well, then you could just get your paper Bible. I love a paper Bible too. And pick a short book like Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, and just read one chapter a day. And that will help you build your consistency in the Word. That will help you find your groove. But as you walk through your house and you enter in the kitchen this week, I want the kitchen to remind you to ask yourself, have I spent time with Jesus and have I spent time in His Word, the bread of life? Well, 
Duke and I would like to welcome you to our living room. Right, Duke? He doesn't talk much. But this is one of another, really, one of my favorite rooms in the house. It's actually one of the reasons that Laura and I purchased this home. Because we love a big living room, not just because we have 35 kids, but because we love to host company. We love to host. Did you hear that word? Host. You might want to type that in your phone or make a comment, the word host, because that's what I want you to think about when you walk into your living room this week. The word host, if you look it up, there's several meanings, but part of the word host that I'm looking for is when it says to entertain guests, but also to have in mind what they like more than what you like. It's preferring another. Let me give you a Bible verse to think about in 1 Corinthians 6.19. 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of who? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Did you remember or did you know that you are hosting the Holy Spirit? You are the home for the Holy Spirit, and you are the host for the Holy Spirit. In your living room, I know here we have couches and chairs and a piano and a TV. You probably have a TV in your living room. Most of us do. Uh, but ask yourself this week and every week, is, is what you're doing in your physical living room, uh, is it hosting the Holy Spirit well? Is he comfortable? Is he enjoying the show? I, I don't say that to be holier than thou. There are some times where the Holy Spirit convicts me. He says, Joey, don't forget that you're hosting me and I purchased you and you're my home. You are the home and the host of the Holy Spirit. And also, I believe this living room is a great representation of the fact that God not only wants us to spend time with Him in the kitchen, eating His Word, sometimes we have a, a morning devotion. And we think that that's all that God wants to do that day. But I, I believe that He wants us to make living room for Him all day long. He wants to do life with us every day, all day as we host the Holy Spirit. Think about that when you're in your living room this week. Welcome to my bedroom. I have to tell you that by the grace of God, I've had the opportunity to travel to lots of countries in the world. I've been to the Philippines, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, India, and I love those places. and I love the people, but I have to tell you, after a week or two weeks away from my family. I love to come home and see my wife and my daughters. And there's one more thing that I love to see. That bed. I love my bed. And I, I, something about sleep that I love. I don't know if you love to sleep like I do, but I need my beauty rest. You know what I mean? And when it comes to sleep, a lot of us don't realize how much is involved. Even scientists, they're still studying sleep. And I did some research on it. And I found out that they don't understand everything about sleep, but there's at least four things that happen while we sleep. It, it, they especially study while kids are sleeping. And number one, they say that while kids are sleeping, their immune system uh, works and becomes strengthened. And that reminds me of us when we're resting uh, spiritually, when we're resting in the Lord, that our immune system is strengthened. We're able to fight off attacks. You see where I'm going here? And number two, it says that they actually grow when they rest. And I think that sometimes a lot, a lot of our growing happens through not just struggling and striving, but through resting in the Lord, trusting God to take care of us. In addition to that, scientists say that when children sleep, their heart becomes stronger, that it actually fights off blood pressure problems and things like that to help them to live healthier and longer. And I believe that your heart and my heart needs rest. And lastly, this one's funny. It says that kids actually calm down when they sleep. Well, we know that when they're running around and they finally pass out somewhere. But it says they actually calm down completely when they sleep. And you've seen this in a little two-year-old who doesn't get enough rest. What happens? They throw a what? A temper tantrum. They have a, a meltdown. Well, I think a lot of us are the same way. Not only physically can we have a meltdown when we don't get enough rest, but even spiritually we can begin to melt down when we don't have time in God's presence, just resting in who He is. Let me read you a Bible verse from 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 
It says, casting all your care upon him, Jesus, for he cares for you. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. I think it would be great for every time that you walk into your bedroom and you see your bed and you say, oh, I can't wait to go to sleep tonight when all my chores are done, when all my responsibilities are done, that not only does it remind you of physical rest, it reminds you that we need to practice and explore what would resting in God look like if I be- began to rest more in God in my life? How, what would I need to trust Him with? What, what would that look like this week in your life? That's what I'm going to think about here in the bedroom. Well, I bet you did not expect me to bring you into this room, the bathroom. But here we are because there's four important things that happen in the bathroom that should be happening in our life and in our walk with the Lord. The first thing is we shower in here. We get clean. You know, the Bible talks about washing ourselves clean with the water of the Word. Every room we enter, it seems like there's a reminder of the importance of the Word of God. Not to be crude or funny, but there's other things that happen in the bathroom. You can't see the toilet, but I'm staring at it. And in that device, things get flushed away that don't need to be here anymore. There might be some things in your life that need to be flushed away, eliminated, removed. And did you think about that that also uses water? We get clean with water and we remove and flush things out of our life with water. There it comes again, the Word. Now, over in the area that I started in is where my wife does a lot of what we call getting ready. She's got all these apparatuses, these tools. She's got hair dryers, curling irons, tools that I'm not sure what, what they're even called, but she gets ready there. And sometimes my daughters get ready there. So lots of women get ready in the bathroom. Men, you may also get ready by shaving and brushing your hair if you're so fortunate to still have yours. But getting ready is something that happens in the bathroom. And I believe that the Lord is asking us to get ready. There are some things in the next season of your life that the Lord wants to get you ready for. But there's one more thing. We get clean, we get ready, we flush some things away. But there's one more thing that happens in my bathroom. And maybe it happens in yours as well. I brought this in here to show you something. This in my house is called the spanking spoon. And the way we grew up in my mama's and daddy's house was mama would say, go to the bathroom, and we're gonna take care of that in a minute. And if mama said go to the bathroom and you didn't feel like you needed to go to the bathroom, that meant something was about to happen. The Bible says, and I don't mean to make light of spanking because it's a serious thing. It's actually an act of discipline. It's not something we do out of anger. But the Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. So spanking sometimes occur in our bathroom. But let me confess, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. But as a grown man, I don't think mama got all the crazy out of me. I don't think daddy was able to deal with all of it. And the Lord has taken on that project because he loves me enough to discipline me. So in our lives, there should be a place for discipline. Let me read you a Bible verse in Hebrews chapter 12. This is a really, really important verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. Listen carefully. If you endure chastening, that's a spanking, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have all become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. The Passion Translation says, it's by the discipline of the Lord that you know that you're a son and not a stranger. Isn't that good to remind ourselves that the Lord loves us and because He loves us, He's gonna discipline us. So as you enter into your bathroom this week, I want you to be reminded of how the Lord wants to cleanse you, how there may be some things He wants to flush away. There's some things that He's getting ready to do in our lives and there's also gonna be discipline. This is the bathroom. This is the final room that I want to show you on Easter at my house. This, you probably didn't think I was going to show you this. I hesitated to show you this. This is my closet. And you know, closets are a room that we don't often show people. Why? Because 
you know, we hide stuff in our closet. You see, in our closet, it's where we keep our secrets. It's where we keep the stuff that we don't want people to see. For example, if company drives up and you didn't know they were coming over, you've got stuff all over the bed, you've got stuff on the floor, where do you hide it? You hide it in the closet. You just throw things in there. And I think the closet can represent a special place in our heart. Sometimes it's a place where we hide sin. Sometimes we hide shame, addictions, our past, unforgiveness, anything that we don't want people to see. Oh, we'll let them in the kitchen. We'll let people see the living room, maybe the bathroom, but not the closet. But in your heart of hearts, God wants to see it all. God wants to see what's in your closet. You see, King David knew that we all have a closet. And he, he wrote a psalm that said it beautifully. He said, search me, O God, and see, search my heart and see if there be anything wicked inside of anything evil. So that's what we need to keep in mind is that we might be trying to hide some things, but God wants to move into this last final frontier, if you will, and deal with the things that we've been hiding, deal with the hurts, deal with the habits. You see, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We need that, right? Cleansing and forgiving. But James also said in chapter 5 that we should confess our sins one to another. And he didn't say the same thing to be forgiven. He said, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. And I think what we can learn from this is some things we just need to confess to the Lord and it's going to be over with. It's done. Other things we confess to the Lord and we're forgiven, but we also need to confess it to our brothers in Christ, to a sister in Christ. We need to get someone on our team so that we can be healed from our hurts, healed from our habits, so that we can get this stuff out of a closet. It's not okay to have a messy closet. God wants to clean us, cleanse us, forgive us, and he wants us to be healed. So you might need to find an accountability partner. You might need to join a small group. You might need to attend something like Hope Dealers is what we have at our church. I don't know what it needs to look like for you, but I know that you probably are going to need to get someone or some group in doing life with you, someone on your team. So as you enter your closet this week, it's different from the bedroom. It's different from the kitchen. As you enter your closet, I want you to remember that sin, it thrives in the dark. But God is ready to turn on his light. Thank you for joining us for Easter at our house. We hope it's been a blessing to you and your house. And in this week, when you're going out throughout the different rooms in your home, when you're in the kitchen, I want you to remember that God wants us to spend time eating His bread of life, the Word of God, every day. When you're in the living room, I want it to remind you that not only should we have a morning devotion with the Lord, we should make living room for Him all day in our lives. When you find yourself in the bedroom, remember that we've got to learn to rest in the Lord, spend time just being in His presence, casting our cares upon Him because He cares for you. Even when you're in the bathroom, remember that there's things there that remind us of our relationship with the Lord. The cleansing of the shower, the flushing away of things, the getting ready for what's next, and even the correction that we so badly need sometimes. And the closet. Don't forget to ask God on a regular basis like King David did. Search me, O God. See if there's anything inside of me that you need to deal with. Turn on the light to my heart with your truth and your conviction. I give you permission Holy Spirit. And if you're watching this today, there's, there's one more thing I wanted to share with you that the Lord reminded me that in our area of the country, you can, a lot of times we're just curious. I, when people buy a new home or a new car, we're a little nosy and we don't ask it out loud, but sometimes we wonder, I wonder what that was worth. Well, what something's worth is how much was paid for it. And you can actually look up the value of a home. You can look up the selling price of a home on the tax assessor's website. It's public record. You can look it up. I said you could look it up. And that's silly for physical homes, but it, I thought the Lord reminded me to tell you that it also applies to his home. How, how much is it worth? You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, then God has made you his home. How much are you worth? How much are you worth to him? Well, you're worth the cost that he paid for you. Well, what did Jesus pay? Well, it's also something you can look up. 
it's not on a, on a particular certain website by the government. It's in the Bible. You can look up the cost that Jesus paid to purchase you as his home. And you'll see that he paid with stripes. He was beaten on his back. He paid, he was pierced with a spear in his side. They nailed his hands and his feet to a cross. And he hung there for about six hours, dying, destitute, lonely, separated, carrying our sins. That's the price that he paid. So you must be worth a whole lot to Jesus because that's the price he paid to make you his home. Today, we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. That's exactly what this day is all about, that Jesus died on the cross to purchase you as his home, and he rose from the dead so that he could come and live inside of us and that we could be with him forever. If you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus, there's no better day than today. There's no better time than right now to decide to make him the Lord of your life, the king of your world, the owner of your house. You could just say, Jesus, come live inside of me. I know that I need a savior. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. I want to be with you forever. And you will be a follower of Christ. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. We want to help you in your journey with Jesus. Have a wonderful Easter at your house. Well, we did at House of Grace. We worshiped and celebrated Jesus and the resurrection right here in our very own homes. Don't forget to 